All right, everybody. This is Elon from the Eggard podcast. I have a guest today, Gil. Uh, Gil, first of all, I just want to say this to everyone watching. We put out a lot of controversial stuff. Uh, some people are offended by it, but very, very few people are willing to talk to us about it. And Gil was nice enough and I will say brave enough uh, to come on board and be willing to have a conversation. And I really, really respect that. I appreciate it. So thank you for coming on, Gil. Yeah, no problem. Happy to be here. So do you want to tell um, us a little bit about yourself before we jump in, just so we know who you are, what you do? and uh, Sure, yeah. I, I'm a student studying finance right now um, in college. And yeah, I'm also studying marketing, but that's my minor. And I also work for a Jewish nonprofit on campus. Amazing. I think uh, it's... Which is cool. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. What's... Oh, no, you're good. No, no, but why not tell us about the, the nonprofit? Just oh, so, so the nonprofit is called Hillel or uh, the Jewish Student Union. Uh, we're an international um, nonprofit or system of nonprofits. And what we do is provide a space for Jewish learning and culture on college campuses, which I think is more important now than ever. So, yeah, I mainly do uh, finance work and then we also just host a lot of events. So we all kind of pitch in for that. It's a very, we have a smaller program there. Um, so it's very student run, but a lot of fun. Great. Um, so it's interesting what caught your attention. We have that ad about biological women in sports. I believe that's the one you saw, right? Was that the one erased? We have a it, couple of ads that are, that have so, garnered strong responses. <laughs> yeah, I think the ad I was getting was something about you. It was like you on a podcast format type thing and you were saying we get a lot of negative responses for uh the trans issue and like how we see like the erasure of women and like our support of cops um so it just struck me as a very political ad mm -hmm. and then i like went to the you know, profile and it's like you're a watch company like that seems kind of it, i didn't see how the two were related personally um and so i commented uh something like how is this a watch ad y'all tripping and then had a bit of a discourse with your uh social media manager so well it's awesome yeah. again that you you were willing to come on so the, the, i'll tell you what ads we've done and what we've gotten the most black for uh originally there was a gillette ad that came out about toxic masculinity we did an ad very much humanizing men and what men go through uh, again, it had nothing to do with what women go through. It was really just kind of focusing on the, the rhetoric toward men and boys. And if we're using healthy rhetoric, that's going to motivate men to do better and be better. And uh, the whole concept of tax, to toxic masculinity as a phrase was challenged a bit in the, uh, in the commercial. Then we did another one in the height of the defund police movement, which supported police, humanized police. Again, it didn't defend bad police. It was just very humanizing, showing that they're human beings. They have a very hard job. And again, the fundamental approach here was if we're trying to have better law enforcement, do we want to vilify them or do we want to show them the best in law enforcement while still drawing attention to the, the issues, uh, but just raising them up and having better conversations and supporting them to see a better future with them. And then I would say the most, and that was a really, that one got a really polarizing response. Uh, there's a lot of animosity toward the police. Uh, I ended up well, a lot of people were seeing for the first time during that movement how um, how a lot of minorities see the police, including myself. Yeah, um, you know, I I along with everyone else was shocked by like the George Floyd uh, incident and like just all the other stories that were coming out at the time. Um, so yeah, I could see why you would get that response. I don't think that we should fully. I, it's ridiculous to say like defund the police, right? Because we need people but protecting I, I us, and they yeah. That was the phrase, though. It was even abolish the police at one point. They had a event where I don't remember which mayor it was, but they were asked, well, are you willing to abolish the police? And when the mayor said no, the entire we're talking about thousands of people started booing this mayor who were there protesting that the general rhetoric. Uh, and I, I've learned this. I've learned that, you know, you have to listen to what people say. What they say is often what they want to do. Right. There's no reason for them to lie. And so if people are saying if the movement is literally the defund police movement, and then they go, well, we're not really trying to defund the police. We're just trying to take some money away from them. We're trying to do this. We're trying to do that while vilifying them 24 hours a day. Uh, it becomes a very hard thing to stand behind. Uh, so I think they would have got more support in terms of criticism had they just taken a more, 
I guess, subtle or more uh, human approach to it. But again, I understand every, everything is polarizing. It, it was a, it was a pretty reaction like based movement at the time. And I think that their reaction was maybe a bit overboard. And as the dust settles, you can try and talk about actual solutions. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, like the media is totally self-interested and like, look at like the most extreme person and like, what are they saying? And like, we got to be scared of this movement. We got to be, so I don't think it was like, uh, everyone that was like behind that movement was like defund the police totally. Or like the, the phrase, like all cops are bastards. Like, I think that these are like extreme reactions and as the dust settled and as like people kind of were able to step back a bit after the initial like trauma of like seeing this and like learning about the it's it's kind of similar to the way people are learning about like Palestine and Israel for the first time mm -hmm. I think where you I have like see what you're seeing and, and we'll jump into this because uh, we sit on similar uh we're, we're closer on Israel and Palestine than we are probably on the main issue, which I think caught a lot of uh, people's attention on the ads, which was the trans issue. Uh, yeah, that that was the main thing I came here to talk about, to be honest. We're kind of on a side caveat. Yeah, no, but it's good because I want yeah. to get to know you and see where you sit on things. And, uh, you know, you seem like a middle of the ground kind of guy. Uh, you seem like a common sense guy. So I, I like the, the fact that you're you're not extreme. I mean, having a conversation with someone who's just like, you're wrong, you're evil, you're this just never goes anywhere. You don't seem like the type. So uh, maybe, maybe I, we'll I, common ground. Yeah. I didn't want to come on here to yell at you. I just like, I don't know. I, the, okay. Your main thing though, that got me was the idea that the trans movement is erasing men and it's erasing women. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Be, because I don't, that's not the way I see it at all. I so see can it I, as it's. So go ahead. Oh, I want you to finish uh, your thought. Yeah. I okay. So I see it as a. Uh, it's an acceptance of a group of people that has typically not been accepted in our culture, versus like they're gonna. I, I don't think that there would be any like correlation or causation between having more trans people and the erasure of men and women, or very, more acceptance for trans people. The the very definition of the trans movement is that gender is a social construct, that there are no biological differences between men and women, that they are entirely, this is, this, this is like the mainstream viewpoint now that's, that they are, that they are no, driven not entirely a by viewpoint. social pressure. Uh, well, they do because they're willing. Who's, I mean, but no one's saying that there's no biological women, difference between men and women. I've had debates with people who, who have said, I'll find you actually videos of, of me talking to people. Uh, where they have been confident to say that the, the differences that exist between men and women exist because of social pressure. In other words, men are pressured at a young age to be more physical and therefore they grow up to be stronger, bigger, so, that it's not biology. I think maybe there's a, are they talking about sex versus gender? So because he, yeah. if they're saying gender is a social construct and the values that we put on to uh, men and women and like their roles in society aren't fixed and they're not like necessarily a difference. Then I think there's more of an argument. I don't know that it's completely true um, because I think like men and women's brains are wired slightly differently. I'm no expert on like this stuff. I'm just, I mean, you know, I'm an it. Instagram commenter. But, uh, <laughs> it's great that you're here talking about it, but there are, yeah, there are yeah. obviously biological differences. I would hope that most people can accept this. Sure. But there are fundamental biological differences between men and women. Women give birth. But when you're talking to someone that, uh, or just in general, there's a, I think it's the issue of conflating sex and gender and seeing it, you know, people that are against the trans movement will typically see them as one thing. And people that are for the trans movement see them as two different things. No, I can accept that gender and sex are different, but then I can't accept that we have to use gender as a standard in all these areas where objectively measuring a person, we should be using their biological sex. If I'm gonna put someone in prison, I should put them in the prison of their biological sex. Yet the trans movement has pushed biological men with a history of rape to be in prison with women, not just in America, but in the UK and Canada where women were raped and impregnated. That is an overstep to me. That is the end result of denying objective reality. Same thing with sports. You had Fallon Fox who went into women's sports who was a low level male fighter was a fighter that would never be ranked in any way, shape, or form in any professional organization, 
was cracking the skull, literally cracked the skull of a very high level pro female fighter. And now they're trying to do it with boxing where they're trying to normalize biological men who transition going into boxing. These are where I think most people have a problem. You know, uh, I'm just going to go on a little rant and then I'll let sure. you answer. But yeah. you ask, if you ask me, hey, go do for I have it. empathy for someone who's going through uh, some kind of gender dysphoria or they believe they are uh, the other sex? Absolutely, I have empathy for it. If it's genuine, if it's real, if it's not part of some kind of identity politics, social contagion, which is where people are deriving value from nowadays, I think that there is a strong element of we have to help people. We have to, we have to, in my opinion, on a personal level, be empathetic to people, cater to people. So if I have a friend and they come to me and they go, look, I'm more comfortable being called he, or I'm more com comfortable being called Jim or Janet, whatever they switch to. Of course, I empathize with that. I'll support them. I won't let someone bully them. But if now I'm told, well, you don't only have to accept that, you have to accept that I am actually this other sex and you have to treat me as such across all avenues of reality, including the things I just mentioned, then no, that's an overstep. Because me me empathizing with you and trying to accommodate you is very different than me saying I'm going to deny objective reality. There are two fundamentally different things. I think that's where most people who have a problem with the trans movement where it's headed and where it's gone now, it's become more extremist, kind of have this, you're talking about reactionary responses. That's where my reactionary response comes from. Sure. And I, I can understand um, the anger that a lot of people feel when they see trans athletes dominating women's sports. Um, that being said, so there's a few things I want to hit on. Uh, first of all, the idea that it's a social contagion or that it's like an ideology that will spread like a religion or like stuff like that, I think is silly. Um, Why I do you think it's silly? Because I think you're just going to have a certain set of the population that experience uh, being trans regardless of acceptance or not. I agree. Um, and that I really, if there are people that are transitioning for attention or for social merit, I think that their numbers are like very insignificant. So if you look at studies, they show that if you look at where trans people are exploding in numbers, they're happening in pockets. In other words, what you have is one group of people, and usually they're younger, they're in high school, and one girl will transition or one male will transition to be a female, and then you will see other people in that group transition as well. Uh, now, if you look at like historical prevalence of, of trans people, true gender dysphoria, which I'm not arguing, exists 100%, prevalence was nowhere near what we're seeing nowadays. And as well, you go, it's, it's being more accepted nowadays. It's like the you've have you seen history. the left-handed example. What's that? Where the left-handed example? It's a it's a pretty common defense of uh, trans people, but it's the idea that in the very early 1900s, it was not socially acceptable to be left-handed, and some of the arguments against being against the social acceptance of left-handedness would be that everyone would become left-handed. It would become like the thing, which is sounds like silly to us now but um back then was a real thing like so then it naturally capped off at like 11 or 12 percent of the population which i think will happen it's like um people thought this would happen with like being homosexual too um so like 30 percent look i'm very pro uh gay rights in terms of like what it historically sure. was saying like if if someone wants to fall in love or someone falls in love with someone else i've never been of the type to say that that's wrong. That is a, a natural preference that they have. Uh, and I, so like, I'm almost socially liberal in that aspect, but I think that is a sexual preference. I don't need to deny any objective reality to accept that position. I do need to deny objective reality to accept that we're gonna put biological men in prison with women. I do, I have to absolutely deny what what is, what okay, I do. But We also can't put like, Have you? are you familiar with like uh, Nikita Dragon? Nikita Dragon? Yeah. It was a popular, um, uh, popular trans influencer that was arrested in Florida for like streaking or something. Um, and like, was it just this person, like you would never know that they were, uh, like assigned male at birth. Right. And then they're put into a men's prison because that's the way it is in Florida. And like, they're like raped and assaulted and like all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And they like have to get their lawyer to get them out. Cause it's like, they look like uh like a porn star basically but they're transgender so they get put in the male prison it's i don't still have there male should be a middle ground 
do they still have i'm not sure i'm not i didn't follow it too closely but that's just an example that came to me when you were talking about the prisons so one thing about Um, it being a social contagion what i will see this is is you know if you look at polling of and i'll just jump back to this right after but if you do look at polling of of kids like 18 and under we're seeing an extremely high prevalence extremely high jump in in kids identifying as lgbtq uh, ia plus you see yeah well they 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 keep adding things to it and then it's well, either way, I mean, people. they're not identifying as cis because we've turned cis or straight, whatever anyone, well, you know, but straight. identifying with LGBTQ, uh, IA, whatever, um, that doesn't make you not cis. That could also mean you're homosexual or well, asexual no, if you're homosexual, or, if you're or homosexual, non-binary. It's, there's so many things under it now. No, no, I'm just putting, you're talking about like homosexual, we're clumping everything together now, LGBTQ, so you're not cis you're either it means you're attracted to men if you're a man it means you're whatever is no. not straight yeah cis is just means you're a, you're a you accept yeah it cis yeah yeah exactly okay so i'm talking about straight so you can be straight cis, cis male. yeah straight straight cis cis, okay sure so if you look at straight cis hairs, male, right now now over 30 whatever percent of kids do not identify as a straight cis male or female that's a huge that's and I don't think that's a natural occurrence. I think what I've seen happen is again, this there is some degree of kids feeling like, and I understand this from an identity politics point of view. If you're a white liberal kid who is told you have no voice because you're white, you are a straight male, you're a problem in society. I hear this rhetoric all the time. I've seen experiments done in schools literally where they took cupcakes away from little kindergartner kids, little white boys, because they said, you're privileged, and so this is what it feels like to not be privileged. They do all these they took kind of cupcakes things. away because they were white. Yeah, they gave the cu- the cupcakes and they gave longer recess to the minorities and told the white kids, "This is why you're, you're not." You're this kidding. Was a study done. The, this was a stu- oh, it was a study to see like what would happen to the kids if no, they did this to help teach white privileged cis straight kids what it's like to have privilege. They, this is like even I don't even know if you saw the the flyers in universities. Just as a Jew, this might relate to you more. But identity politics with Jews on the left, there are literally there were literally uh, flyers showing like the identity hierarchy of how Jews are privileged, they're above white people, and how they are oppressors and how they're this. This is the game of identity. I have never seen that. I'll say I, that. I know the posters on campus where it's the kidnapped people, but I'm talking about before the... October seventh. I'm talking about identity politics in general against Jews. Uh, oh it, sure, people... yeah. I mean, people will use anything against Jews. No, but they do it against. I'm a punching people. bag. Look, I, yeah. I'll say this. I'm, an, I'm Iraqi. I don't identify as white. I'm I'm Iraqi. My family had to escape Iraq. Mm. I am Jewish. But I've seen rhetoric that's terrible against Jews. I've seen terrible <laughs> rhetoric, terrible against white males in general. And if you're a white male growing up and you don't feel like you have value, you don't feel like you have a voice, you want to feel like you're more important in society, a very easy way to do that is to just identify as LGBTQIA plus 15, whatever the the thing is on it. Now, again, that doesn't mean that there's not. And by the way, in this study, another thing that that indicates to me, when you look at the polling of like 30 percent of kids under the age of I don't remember if it was like 18 or 21 identifying as LGBTQ. When you ask them how many experiences have you had that are LGBT or like not T, but LGB, like real, like have you had a partner that is, is same sex? The answer, no, the majority of them. So they're just identifying as it because it's socially trending. You can you not? Oh, but that? then they're not. Then it. Okay, sure. I mean, that's. I if that's happening, um, I haven't. I'm no expert in this. So I'm. And my experience in high school was that the gay people were gay and the trans people were trans, and they weren't doing it for attention. Um, but sure if but then it's like if they're not actually doing it like in like a year or two they're probably going to be like oh that was a weird phase i agree it's like they're not sure but then what's the issue the issue is like kids pretending to be something for like a year or two like it's not gonna i'm and i'm not trying to like say oh they're pretending to be gay but it's like if you're just saying it and not like i don't know so what my problem it's not look with the with the lgb aspect of it i actually don't i think it's it's in some ways very harmless if they're not actually even if they were to act on it and explore and that's how they or what what if they, they want to go by to they for a year like what? or go what if they want to go by they for a year or so my like, go with by she for a year instead of he what does it matter because if we start going toward the avenue which has happened of giving kids hormone blockers 
giving them, uh, you know, gender reassignment surgery, and they are not well, truly prepared to do that because they're children, then that is to me child abuse. And that's, again, okay, that's- Okay, so gender reassignment surgery is on very rare cases given to like 17, 16 and 17 year olds at the very earliest. There have been with cases, parental consent there have been cases and as young as 14 and there's even cases now there, but it's not fine. legal no it like is in the law there's no they can get uh hormone replacement but they can't get no one's getting gender reassignment surgery before like the age of 16. but a hormone first of all i i i know that there are now groups of legitimate doctors pushing for mastectomies as young as like as at puberty essentially once they the breasts grow that's when they're trying to remove them to allow the child to have a fully developed life as the other gender. I mean, it's not a far-fetched idea that if we're doing it on 16 and 17 year olds, and I know there is a case or a few cases where I even uh, read they were doing it on 14 year olds and they've heard doctors from their own mouth advocate. You know why they're doing it, right? I mean, you said that you, you feel empathy towards uh, trans people and people with gender dysphoria, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. um, and so you know that they're at way higher risk for suicide or higher risk for self-harm and that giving. And so when you actually have medical intervention, you're having a lot of like psychiatrist meetings, you're having a lot of doctor meetings and you're talking to the parents as well to make sure it's not just like, Oh, I think it's, you know, it's not just like a phase for these kids. Like they're actually experiencing like negative effects from seeing their body the way that they don't like want it to but be. Again, so two and things. they're what? like, do you want to, it's not just like that. Sure. And it's not just like the insecurity that like you or I might feel like we want to like look uh, a certain way, like um, to like impress the ladies or whatever. Like, it's like, I want to like kill myself because mm -hmm. I don't look like the gender that I feel like. Okay. And so, so it's like in those cases, they should get medical intervention. Okay, so I agree. Medical intervention. They shouldn't have, you know, hormone blockers or gender reassignment surgery until they're That's fully medical pregnant. intervention. Well, no, there's other forms of medical intervention. Uh, and the medical intervention in the form of hormone blockers has not reduced suicide rates. Numerous studies are now coming out showing it has no measurable impact on the rate of suicide, which is upward attempts of 50 percent. There's something else going on with trans kids and the rate at which they try and commit suicide. And just giving them hormone blockers does not solve it. There's something else going on there. And again, if you can see that there is some degree of social contagion where we're trying to, where we're saying there is an identity politics driven incentive to identify as LGBT. I just think it would be so minuscule, like the amount of the social, going back to the social contagion stuff. Like if there are people that are just doing it for a try, I just think it would be small, even compared to the subset of the population that is trans. I, I disagree. I think the social contagion aspect of it is far bigger than you might be aware of. And that's maybe where one area where we strongly disagree. But on the other area where we disagree is on the idea that a 12 year old who's about to go through puberty is able to make such an advanced decision that they can determine their future gender for the rest of their life by literally cutting off one of the most important biological processes that occur in your life. They can't even smoke for the next 10 years. They can't drink for the next 10 years. They can't consent to sex. For the next 10 years but they can literally take hormone blockers which will shut off a natural biological function in the body that is irreversible if you take hormone blockers for those two to three years you are never going to go back you are never going to develop as you as you naturally should have developed it is literally counter to all of nature and all of history and all of biology to shut that process off and we're doing it on 12 year olds who cannot even consent to having sex never mind changing their sex so to me, it's just so okay. There, it's not a full. It, I don't. Okay, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in hormone replacement, no, but, and I, I doubt that you are either. No offense. No, no. Um, uh, and I would just say, like in the cases which it's being done, it's probably. I'm sure it's being done with doctor and expert oversight, and. I'm just not going to like pretend to know more than the doctors about this. Like, I think if it's, it's, there's evidence that shows that it does reduce suicide rates. Um, I've looked into this and yes, there, I've seen I'll studies you, like what you're saying. No, no, but oh, shit. But, sorry. Are you there? Uh, I yeah, I'm here. 
So the and my computer just bugged out for a second. The oh, you're um, good. So the studies that looked at like depression and suicide rates amongst trans kids was very, very misleading. And, th and this is something that really bothers me that that science has taken a political activist turn. One of the things that they omitted was when they were giving kids hormone uh, replacement therapy in that study, they refused to give uh, hormone blockers to kids who were already suffering from high, high levels of depression and high levels of, uh, of wanting to commit suicide. So and suicidal tendencies, because they said that introducing another element into this would screw up the whole study. But then they kept those kids uh, as part of the study to determine who was not on suicide blockers. So they took they said, we're not even going to put you in the study. And we're not even going to give you hormone blockers if you already want to kill yourself. And then we're going to count you towards the people who do have higher suicide rates and do attempt suicide. That's a completely distorted way of looking at things. If I said I'm going to not give the medication to everyone who has cancer let's say i was trying to determine who lives longer with this medication i said but everyone who has cancer can't qualify for this medication but we're still going to count you in the study of people who didn't get it well that's sorry you just screwed up the whole study you're, you're literally taking people who are dying and then saying well i'm going to include them in the study on the side that d disagrees with my opinion so doctors have become active. i'm going to have to look at the specific studies i'll, I'll send you the article i promise you i'll yeah. send it to you it shows in my in my experience in times i actually was recently uh debating a guy named Steve Kirsch on vaccines and he just would bring up like studies um, of all this stuff and be like oh look at all this like raw data and look at all this stuff and then when you look at the actual abstracts of the studies like it's going to say a different thing that's going to be the expert opinion um, and like there's been a lot of different studies on all this and I don't know which ones you're talking about I'd have to read them but I I'm just not sure. Like, no, I, understand I, that it, I would have to, it, yeah, I, I'd I have to, it, if you're it, saying it, one it, study yeah. is bad and then the study like that you're seeing is like good, I just, yeah. No, I'm saying that the kids who are committing suicide are committing suicide because there is a psychological, uh, it is a, it is but a. But it makes sense so not to give it. hormones to people that are like super high in suicide rate or like super okay. at risk. And you have to omit yeah. them study entirely you can't just say well they're part of the group that was now followed to see if they kill themselves we couldn't give them the medication because they're already suicidal but we're going to follow them and see if they kill themselves and then count them toward the opposite side no you don't do that you omit them from the study completely you look yeah, at well, uh, and then, i think a lot of the ways these studies are done is they actually just ask the people that receive the hormone treatment they say are you feeling better are you feeling less suicidal sorry oh, you're to... uh what yeah some, it's this mic. This mic. Uh, this mic messes everything uh, up. I'm. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but okay. So I'll just repeat that last point that I was saying. I the so I don't have a specific study for you either. I did a little bit of research before this, um, and I think one of the studies I found, which was like linked through a larger like CDC or uh, HRI article was that and i don't want to go through all my i've got way too many tabs open so i don't want to go through all this but i, no, don't I worry think about in the study I here's saw, the deal here's the deal we'll the send you other... okay because then it'll Maybe yeah, have a follow-up so so here's here's what i want to ask you i have a i have a couple questions yeah. and i know you're not going to like the, these questions because you're going to feel like they're probably disingenuous but they're not they're really intended to be um if there was a group of people in society saying that they're suicidal or they identify as having no no arms right like and there is a real condition by the way there's a psychological condition where people believe yeah. they should not have their limb they believe they were meant to be uh, amputees handicapped sure should they let's say a 12 year old is every day by the way i had like ocd when i was a kid i kept wanting to poke out my eye i didn't want my eyeball in my head it was driving me crazy and it was weird but it's a real thing and had i gone to a doctor a 12 year old and said my eye is not supposed to be in my head should he have removed my eyeball? Or if it was my arm, should he have removed my arm? And I said, I identify as truly being blind. That's how I believe I'm supposed to be blind. That is what I believe I'm supposed to be. Should they blind me? Huh? No. Sure. Why not? What? Because they're, yeah, it's permanent damage. And But it's like, if you're at a point where you're going to kill yourself, if you don't have this eye, like, taken out then maybe get the kid an eye patch, you know? 
But like, in iPads, get... off. I'm talking about I, I, that's not good enough for me. I want to remove my eyes. I'm well, not. You, well, you're a kid. You can't remove your eye. But then why don't we use that standard for for? But we do. We I don't. I don't know. You see hormones. hormones as removing the eye. I see like um just full reconstructive genital surgery as removing the eye. Like I don't. I haven't done research on how like how permanent hormone changes are, but it's not. Um, it's definitely not as permanent as a gender uh, genital reconstruction surgery. I mean, in a different way, it's it's permanent. It cuts. I, I so I did a documentary, and, and it was on cancel culture initially, uh, and I ended up having legitimate uh, professors from all types of universities, more more liberal, come on, and openly tell me because they didn't want to be on the documentary talking about it, but openly tell me that yes, this is entirely permanent. It's entirely unethical. Like that was. That was actually the mainstream, oddly, the mainstream opinion. But they all said, we just won't ever mention it. Yeah. Telling me this behind, uh, and I'll probably have to block the name just to avoid any repercussion. Uh, but it's like a real issue. So how do I feel like men and women are being erased, the erasure of men and women? Yeah, well, because you're saying it's like there are these pockets and all these kids are like thinking that they're trans now when they're not or like they're, you know, uh, I, I think you're going to bring up sports here and how like that, but it just in the broader picture, it doesn't show like a ratio of men and women. It kind of gives me the same vibes and I'm sorry to do this. Cause I know, um, you know, we're both Jewish, but like the, the idea that like the white replacement, you know, if, mm -hmm. if we have, uh, more immigrants come in, if we have more non-white people come in, then white people are going to be erased. White people's culture is going to be gone. And it's like, uh that like i don't think either are true i think we can live in a pluralistic society where trans people and cis people both exist and both have like their own space and like everyone's i don't know i see a very so, so idealistic let me, just, let me just explain this when you say white people that is a a race or an ethnicity of people when you, when you talk about men and women you were talking about redefining what a man is and what a woman is like can you give me the definition of a man Huh? Can you define I, I would, for me? Sure. Yeah, a man is someone who identifies as a man. That's not a definition, and you know it. Okay. I mean, I'm not. Uh, it, it would be like me what, saying, you want me to say house, someone a house is something that's a you house. Know, do you want me to? Is this like the gotcha where, like, I say something? Not a gotcha. You're, uh, you're asking yeah. me, why do I think that, that there's an erasure of men and women? Because I have the, uh, yet to meet one person who can identify what a man is without saying who's who's very pro-trans without saying that a man is someone who identifies as a man that is actually like i know you're saying you're not an expert on it but that is the standard response which is not a response i mean you it, you know you're an intelligent person you know that's not if you told me what's the definition define a car for me and i was like a car is a car a car is something that believes it's a car you would say that's not a definition a okay car is something it's a motor sure. vehicle a, a man is someone with an x y chromosome is that what you want? File? No, I don't want any anything other than an yeah. honest answer. But then, then okay. you can't. So sure, an X, an X Y chromosome, unless they choose to identify. Like, because here's the thing, right? <laughs> if you want to say like a man, men and women are in these boxes. Sure, like I can totally understand. Like I've taken biology classes. Like X X chromosome equals a woman, or X Y chromosome equals a man. But then at the same time, I don't want to invalidate people that feel as uh, that want to identify as a man, but have XX. But they're by your own definition, not a man. They just feel like yeah, but, they believe they are much in the way that I might believe I'm. Yeah, uh, you and, know. and so by me, by me saying, oh, I see you as a man and you've taken all these steps to be a man like that helps them not kill themselves. But what if they don't? Okay, right? so number one, I don't know if it helps them not kill themselves, but it, I, uh, again, it clearly helps them not kill themselves. I see, it, it, you just but, have like a society that's beating on these people and like saying, you know, right. you you don't get to be the way you feel, and I'm like, this is America. You can be whoever you want. Sure, you can be whoever you want. You can feel however you want, but again, you don't get to be ex ex accepted objectively in terms of places of measurement as that thing. Just like I can't say I'm a 12-year-old. Imagine there's a pedophile out there who goes, I identify as a 12-year-old. 
and then wants to go sleep with 12 year olds. And he goes, but I really believe I'm a 12 year old. Well, by the, and actually I will say this, I will say that age is far yeah, more subjective that's... than gender. I will say that like, or biological sex, I will say that biological sex age is more subjective in terms of being able to identify it immediately on a person. If there was a body that came onto a beach and it was in a coma or dead, and I had to identify it like that, the main characteristics of it, the first thing I would be able to identify is its biological sex. I would be able to estimate its age. I wouldn't know this guy's 46 days and 46 years and three days and 50 minutes old. I would say he's probably in his 40s, and I could be very wrong about that. He might be in his 30s. He might be in his 20s. Sure. He might even be in his 50s. I would... the difference between sex and gender, right? But again, if, if we're going to say they're two different things, then you're going to be able to identify the sex of the body on the beach and not the gender. Not that that really seems to make a big difference to you when you find a dead body at the beach, but I, if we're talking about the social issues, it's an important distinction. Sure, but if we're talking about then again objectively measuring someone in reality, then we measure them by their. But I understand people want to say there's gender and there's sex. Okay, fine, I'll go with that supposition. But then when it comes to prisons, when it comes to sports, when it comes to which bathroom you use, when it comes to all these areas, your biological sex is for medicine. How you're treated, your okay, biological well, the, sex is far hmm. more relevant and far more measurable and far more important as a as what where you should go in these areas. Then you're then you're self-determined gender, just like I don't believe that age. The, the bathroom stuff is ridiculous. Because it doesn't matter what no, it is. I'm talking about in all areas okay. of, of measure. Well, you no, know, because the the uh you know reactionary movement to the trans movement, which is like the anti-trans movement, it it likes to find all these like small uh things that it can blow out of proportion to try and vilify trans people or say that. Trans people are disingenuous and have ulterior motives. I didn't say that. And That's not no, I, I know you didn't say that, but I'm like, I'm expanding on the on the talking points that you're throwing out, like the bathroom issue. But I, I just said the bathroom as one of like 15 things. Prison. One of three bathroom. things. Prison, sports, bathroom. Sports, bathroom, medicine, uh, women's shelters. I can keep going. Women's uh, homeless shelters, women's abuse shelters. Uh, and medicine in itself is like a hundred different things. Pregnancy. I don't think we should use the term birthing people. They're mothers. People who give well, birth are women. Okay. Yeah. I mean, birthing like, people. That's the, that's the term birthing people. Who's saying birthing people. There was even a document that came out in the white house saying that they have to start referring to people. Uh, no way. If no. you sure, if they're, if they're saying in the white house, you cannot say woman, you have to say birthing person then yeah, I'll agree with you. It's gone too far. I'm going to send you so much stuff, man, because you have no idea what's actually. All right. Okay. So when it comes to. In the phrase birthing people has been suggested to replace the name from mothers to allow women to have. It's taken been suggested by system. some person on Twitter, right? Like who's suggesting it? It's I, again, this is another example of like little. Your budget replaced the word mother with birthing people. This is from Newsweek. What, uh, what fiscal report? 2022 fiscal report. Uh, I have other examples okay. of it. Biden and men replaces. Here, I'll send it to you. Like the U.S. government fiscal report. I mean, sure, whatever. No, but that shows a At trend. End, you talk about the erasure of women. I mean, it's not some isolated thing. I'm not saying it's not just but women, women will in 50 years. If the trans movement gets everything they want, women will still be women and men will still be men. And you'll just have a group of people that can transition or that did transition. Because there won't be any definition for what a woman is and what a man is. That's my my fundamental issue in all this. You're, you know, like you're saying what made me feel like there's an erasure of women and men. Number one, again, I just believe that women deserve their their spaces after everything they've been through historically. I believe that if a woman is abused by a man, she should not go into a shelter where a biological man can show up, which, again, has happened. It's not to say but, the man has bad intentions, by the way. People, That's not no, but the, if pe people that are going into these spaces and assaulting, I think are going to do it regardless of whether they have laws protecting trans people in place or not. Uh, for example, like in 75, Minnesota allowed uh, people to use whatever bathroom they identified with. And since then, and there's been a bunch of other cities since then that have done it. And there hasn't been a reported... Uh, increase in in bathroom related violence or 
Um, and there, it has never been used as legal cover in someone's assault case. But I'm saying putting biological men who identify as women in a place for women who have been abused, a shelter, where women are going to feel, trying to feel safe, trying to escape abuse. Biological men should not be in those spaces. I don't care if they're trans. And I know that makes me non-inclusive, but there seems to be a big sacrifice of women's rights in exchange for trans rights, in my opinion. Uh, again, the prison thing is a real thing. I can send you an article right now of 24 women being raped in a prison by a man who was a biological male who identified as a female who was... Oh, I can believe that. Sure. I, I, You don't got to send me that. I don't like... But sure, yeah. There, And that's a problem. There, That should be like... Yeah, you shouldn't have like rapists in prison, but that's like something that happens there. I don't, I don't have a good solution for that. I'm not honest, because then you also have people that have gone through so much to transition into like trans, uh, trans women that have transitioned into that, and then you throw them into male prisons, and then they get raped. So when Biden uh, passed the the bill to allow people to identify as whatever they want in prisons and then be transferred. There was something like 680 transfers within 24 hours being requested. Not one was a female requesting to be transferred or biological female being requested to be transferred to a male prison. They were all biological males requesting to be transferred to female prisons. And if you look at like the issue as a whole, it's mostly men, oddly, mostly men in, in everything, in sports, in, in prisons. It's, it's biological men who are identifying as female who are taking these women's spaces. So I'm not as worried, just to be totally honest, oh, men okay. being, being, you know, uh, at the crux of this. I'm more worried about biological women being at the crux of this and suffering. Uh, sure. And so, um, I, and, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, and so that makes sense. And I think for all these uh, issues that you're bringing up, there should just be more rigorous checks. Like for if someone requests to transfer because they're trans and they're not in the prison they identify with, you have a psychological evaluation. You say, how likely is the risk of this person assaulting people in their new prison versus assaulting people in their old prison? How, you know, how much have they like actually put into being transitioned uh, or like how long have they felt like this? How long have they like, you know, are they doing it for ulterior, ulterior motives or not? And then for sports, you can say like, it's up to the individual organizations, but um, generally people should compete with their like assigned at gen or assigned at birth gender or sex or whatever. Um, and like, then if you've had blank amount of years of hormone replacement, then maybe you qualify on like a case by case basis. Oh man, my camera again. But the, the problem with, here, let me just, I'm right back. The problem with, uh, hormone replacement therapy or even gender reassignment surgery, if you look at a, the, the well, I don't think the gender reassignment surgery helps in sports. Of course, yeah, because they still have testosterone until they, they take some kind of hormone blocker or estrogen. Yeah, the and then there should be some sort of equation. And again, I'm not an expert, but it's like years that you've been alive versus years you've been receiving hormone replacement therapy. And then there's some level on which you can compete. Doesn't this contradict the entire presupposition that a man is someone who identifies as a man? What you're saying is no. A man is not someone who identifies as a man. A man is someone who identifies as a man who then takes hormone replacement therapy for a certain amount of time, like estrogen, who then does, you know, whatever to reduce the biological benefits in, in that arena of being a man. You know, now we're putting stipulations on what it means to be a man. And so, well, but you, I mean, for things like prison and sports, if you want to talk about those things, there should be. Why? Right. Be well, because you don't like, yeah, in well, all the things you just brought up. I don't totally disagree with you on these things. No, I know. You I, just think very, that... you're, you, I see conflict with you because I see you admitting that there is a fundamental biological difference, but you want to accommodate people. Look, I'll be honest with yeah, you. Yeah, and so it's different. I mean, free market, right? Any, like, companies, organizations, they can do what they want. Um, but at the same time, if you're going to have, like, a sports organization, you don't want people that, like – you know, since we have things like steroids and things like, you know, all these like performance enhancing drugs, and there's a list of banned ones and a list of like regulations of what can be in your body. Um, then if someone wants to transition and then play in the sport that they want to play in, and uh, or I guess this is really only about trans women, because no one really like, 
Yeah, no one's uh, going to be but, angry about a woman going to compete, a biological woman competing against yeah. men. Uh, which, well, least, honestly, it, which honestly makes the entire it's point. Fairness. It's about fairness. Yeah, but you know, and, for fairness, I think I, that it's fairness for one person and, and unfair for the other. I think it's not fair toward women at all. And that's the problem with the word fairness. It can't be one way. It can't be like, hey, you know, women have this massive disadvantage or a massive risk or need their spaces. But to be fair to another group, we're just going to completely disregard all that. That's what my dog is just going crazy right now. That's why the word fairness uh, has always been a little bit abused in my mind. Uh, it's even abused in cases like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict a lot of the time. It's just not a word that I think, because like, what, what does it really mean? I, I think in the end of the day, women have to have, we have to be able to measure people. We have to be able to say you are objectively this gender, right? If we're going to separate the two, why are you this gender? It has to have a definition. And then we're, if we're going to use that as the standard and we're going to deny biological sex, it has to make sense. And so far, the only answer, and this is why I'm, I'm afraid of the erasure of women, is because the only answer I ever get is, well, a woman is someone who says they're a woman. Okay, well, then today I'm a woman. And I, I, the non-binary stuff, I just, I mean, to be totally honest, I just don't, I don't get it. But uh, I understand that, like. Yeah, I mean, I think that might be a better, uh, a better argument for you that they're erasing men and women. Because they're, they're saying, I'm not either of them. But it's America, you know, it's a, if that makes them feel better, then like, I don't care if they're non-binary. I don't, you know, I don't they should care. compete with like, yeah. I don't care if they're non-binary and I don't care if it makes them feel better. And I will actually refer to people, like I said, as they want to be referred to. But again, I care when it becomes an, a, a thing that society has to accept as a whole, much like I can't accept, you know, my dad always used to tell me when he was young, this is before the whole trans movement, he's like, when I was young, I really believed I was a fire truck. He's like, I was obsessed with fire trucks. I believed I was a fire truck. Yeah. And he would actually go around telling people he's a fire truck. But, you know, he grew up and he realized he's not a fire truck. Um, yeah. And I think that when you just create this entirely morally relativistic society where there's no objective truth, where people can identify as whatever they want, there's no standards for anything. It's extremely detrimental to the safety of people long term. And to their own their own health and other people's health, uh, and I think that that's the path we're headed down, which I think is tragic. And again, just fundamentally, the reason I believe men and women are being erased is because there's no longer a definition for men and women. That's it. If if we could all agree that yeah, a man is still a biological man and a woman is still a biological woman, but that there's gender, but we're not going to use gender in areas where we try and measure a man and a woman, then problem solved for me. Uh, I understand in prisons you're okay. saying like, there's people who you, this person who look like a porn star. Well, that's you, you, can, you can do it on a case by case basis. Is what I'm saying. You couldn't there'd be no way to manage that? It would be incredibly. Difficult. Well, it's it, it's again trans is like very small subset of the population, and trans athletes are an even smaller subset of the population. So I don't think it would be that hard. So I would I would like to get you in touch with this this woman I interviewed. Oh man, my computers! This mic is just stealing all the. So this the reason I got the new mic. The, the swimmer. Uh, no, that's uh, that's Riley Gaines, but she works with Riley Gaines. It's, it's this organization called Icons. Uh, mm. I did an interview with them on this channel, and um, uh, she interviews all the athletes who are women who uh, have been targeted by this women who are losing their scholarships and when they speak up, they're targeted. And she's like, it, it, she said, it's a much more pervasive issue than people realize. She has all the studies and all these testimonials. She'll send it all to you if you want to reach out to her. Uh, and it, the organization is called icons and she'll have a talk with you, by the way, she's just like a really okay. wonderful person. If, if you want more information, um, Syria, but okay. Getting, so, you know, I feel like I've said my piece about trans people and so have you, but why do you think that this is like an effective way to market your watch company? I don't. I think we get a lot of hate for it, but uh, my watch so why company. Why don't you make like a separate YouTube or like a separate Instagram for your podcast? Because we already have a big following. We, uh, at this point, I mean, I'm all in. <laughs> at this point, it's kind of like uh, no one who, who thinks the way you do wants to buy my watch. Usually, you know. And you're more moderate, but there's a lot of people. Well, but here's the thing: is I'm the target market for your watch company. No, like, not I'm, anymore, though, I'm a, Sorry, go ahead. Well, I'm I'm a young guy that loves watches, and I think you're doing the right stuff at your price point for sure. Like you're using, 
you know, you're customizing like uh, movements from like Seiko and like other companies. Yoda, yeah. And we do Swiss assembly or American assembly. We don't use uh, China for our assembly. Um, no, there, and you have some unique paper. like case designs too. Like I like the stuff you're doing, but when I like look at your watch company, it's just all this culture war like BS. And I'm like, See, but that I doesn't make me want to buy a watch because it's all about brand perception for me, at least when I want to like, buy that, something. I understand that completely. Not everything in my life is is about money. I so I built a brand uh, as a way to. So my father and I, uh, he helped me through a lot of stuff, and he's been a strong influence on my life. And so if I'm, I've always wanted to use the brand as something that has some kind of impact on society. And that didn't mean initially I didn't believe it would be about any of this stuff. I didn't believe it would be about trans or I didn't even know these issues when I first started my brand. You know, 15 years ago, they weren't as relevant in society. I knew trans people existed, but it wasn't the phenomenon it is today in terms of how it's acknowledged and talked about. Uh, so that wasn't the goal going in. The goal going in was let me make something that inspires people. Let me make something that uh, people can use to give to people they love. And then the thing with Gillette happened and the brand has always had a masculine element to it. And I didn't like the rhetoric toward men at the time and, and boys. And I thought, let me put out something that really humanizes boys, humanizes men, shows people that, you know, if you're going through something, you don't need to be silent about it. Uh, and that there's a lot of contributions in society toward men. So it's, it, it started blending in that way. And then with the police, I mean, again, I would just like no companies willing to speak up against them. Every single company, whether it's Amazon or, Ben and Jerry's, they're all allowed to be political. They're all allowed to be political on the left, but no one's allowed to challenge anything if they're a company on the other side and say, hey, let's look at these issues. And so I don't think it's a good idea for them to be political. At a, like, I don't think it's a good idea for companies to be political. I mean, so I'm studying if, like and I agree right with you. if no other companies were speaking up about all these other issues on the other side, I would never have used my if the Gillette ad never came out, I would have never made an ad if the defund police movement didn't have all these corporations doing campaigns and ads and all this stuff. I would have never done a counter to it. It's always, I'm always giving a response. The thing that inspired, by the way, the erased ad was a trend mm -hmm. with companies to start highlighting trans athletes. And I said, Hey, wait a minute here for every trans athlete that wins. That's a woman, a biological woman who did not So let me make an ad supporting those women. That's always been my thought process. It's always a response to what I see from other companies. I was never the first, if that makes sense. And so I can't do it as an individual. There's I'm, always, yeah, sure. There's always going to be like someone out there you can pick a fight with. I, I don't think from it's my perspective, I think I'm I've, trying to humanize situations. I'm trying to say, hey, we're all human. Let's not forget that. But let's also not sacrifice other people for the benefit of like you're talking about fairness or a response to Gillette is pretty combative, right? No, like I think the ad was combative and I was human. Watch the, okay, well, the ad I did. The, I ad, think, I did yeah, yeah. the ad I did is very humanizing. It's I know, but it's the idea of it that's combative and the fact that you're like, and I'm not, I've never run a watch company, right? Um, but I just think if you're going to do stuff to support the police, great. Like make a watch and donate some of the proceeds. Like as far as marketing, you're just, and I guess I'm a special case because now I'm here talking to you and I've actually looked into your watch brand. But in general, like seeing an ad like that where it's totally political, I'm never going to check out your watches. Did you and see I'm the, never going to like. Did you see the police ad we did? Uh, yeah. I'm, I mean, I'm just talking about the ad I got personally. Oh, OK. Um, but, yeah, that ad. So like I, I said, talked I about police, all, but it, now I'm in a position. So the police said I thought was very humanizing and very nice. And it wasn't even political. It was just, again, humanizing people uh, in a time where there's a lot of escalation. It was, in my opinion, the, the opposite of combative. It was saying, hey, let's come together. Let's start celebrating each other again. Kind of the same idea with men. My view with men was we should be celebrating masculinity. We should be celebrating femininity. We should be looking at the problems of both, trying to lift each other up. It shouldn't be a competition of oppression. Uh, and I have that view with most things. Uh, but it's now my company's at a point when I did the, uh, the police ad, I didn't only get tons of death threats. I had people target me. I had all types of crazy stuff and calling me a white supremacist again, Iraqi Jew. Yeah. I, I cannot be a white yeah. supremacist. Even if I wanted to be, they would just they kill wouldn't me. let you in. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't want me in. Trust me. I don't, you know what I mean? 
and yeah. I don't look white enough for them to be. I look kind of white, but I look like a mix. And, and so they wouldn't even want me just off the way. <laughs> I look like a Puerto Rican. So uh, it's a problem for these people. They don't know how to come at me, but their only option is to call me a white supremacist. Uh, and so I have distanced myself from people who disagree with my message and I focused on the people who agree with it. And that's my that's honestly my market now. And if they don't buy my watch, I'll go out of business. You know, I've been lucky to have I'm a very entrepreneurial guy. I will always make money. I'll always be fine. I invest in tons of stuff. I, you know, so I'm not so and in my life, again, it, it was never about money. It was about having a voice. Um, sure. And I think if you like want to speak truth to power, like what have you like go for it all all power to you i just think it's a bad marketing strategy it may be uh, maybe it is, but we do get yeah, support and it, from the people who agree with us also uh sure. it's, my market is is smaller it's more niche it's more specific um but again i mean look i'm an actor you know that but, right yeah yeah uh, you were on the walking dead and big short big short slasher i was on a a TV show called Slasher. I was one of the main actors on that. And by the way, I played a played a bisexual guy on that show. Um, and it's just fascinating to see how much my career is impacted by being vocal about this. Um, so it, yeah, it's I mean, boring. there's the, the amount like the internet's such a cesspool of like you know death threats and like crazies that just want to like be keyboard warriors and yeah, I. It, and I'm, it sucks for you that you're getting that while you're trying to like promote a message that you really believe in. And that yeah. I don't think is like, you, you really don't seem like a super controversial guy. Like having talked to you, like you're not, you know, you're not saying like the trans people are committing a sin and they need to be like, <laughs> no, you know, not how I see it. Hell and all that. Yeah. But sure. You're looking at it from a logical perspective. Um, but I'm just like, why don't you just, start like the Elon podcast, you know, or like the whatever, like, I don't oh, know. No, I, I, I really I'm love watch start. companies or like watches in general. And I, I'll get into all the little like niches and specifics of like, how is this made? What do they do? That's different. in this one versus this one, and, like, you know, Oh, what is this design taking from like other designs and all that? And it just, it, what if like no other watch company is being political you're seeing like bud light and like and not that that's a reason not to be but like i don't know it's just building something with longevity and where you can actually like have customers and then when you have your podcast you can promote your watch company and then you'll have the same support and the same uh yeah the same like so, base group that's giving I, you all your business. I do want to make, uh, like I said, I do want to make my own podcast. Um, right now, my biggest platform is my watch company. If I can transfer that audience over to my own podcast, I will for sure. But the reality is at this point that my company is branded as it is, you know, and I'm, I'm not going to apologize for anything I've said or done. I believe in what I've said or done. So I'm, I'm happy to stand by it. Sure. So at this point, there's no, like I said, there's no one. And you're very moderate, but most people are more extreme than you. None of those people will even look at my brand or consider my brand. They just think I'm a white supremacist. That's like the go-to position. Or that I'm transphobic. And I understand that I'm branded as transphobic. I can actually accept that people call me that because what I am saying to some extent is that I, I'm not transphobic in the sense that I'm scared of trans people. But I do think... Yeah, and you did say earlier in this podcast you would call someone by their preferred pronouns and like accept them. And that I would have empathy and yeah. I hope that they get and I hope that they get whatever they need to feel better. And as an adult, if you want to go on any type of replacement therapy or a gender... But it's not just empathy. It's like kind of acceptance that this is how you're going to like treat them and talk to them. Oh, and yeah. like when you're talking to someone... Like when you're talking to someone else where you use like their... You know, you would still use their pronoun, I assume. A hundred percent. Well, I mean, maybe I not. would use yeah. their name or their pronoun, whatever was the the proper thing. And like, normally, I refer to people by their name. I don't go out of my way to use their pronoun. But if there was a if a reference yeah. to them, I would use their pronoun. Yeah, I'm not the type of person who's like, yeah. I'm just gonna try and create conflict here and make you miserable by like. If you came on this and you're like, look, I identify as they. That's the truth. It makes me feel better. I would dig into maybe why I'd want to understand why you think that way and why you want to see yourself as they, but I would still refer to you as they, 
And even when I approached why you see yourself as they are, we try and do it with empathy and understanding. My goal is to understand people. It's not to vilify them and put them down. There'd be no benefit to that. But again, I will stand up for what I see as the group that is suffering the most from something. I think, by the way, I think the way the trans movement is today is damaging trans rights more than it's helping trans rights, as opposed to taking a more moderate position that pulls over a lot more of society. Because even when I put out those videos, you'd be surprised. There's a lot of uh, people who are more liberal, way more liberal than you even, who came out and were like, this is a fracture point for me on the left. This is an area where I have a big problem as a woman seeing these things happen. And so it's not just a political issue. It's a it's an issue that I see stem across uh, party lines, which is super interesting. Um, and so we're not having conversations about it. We're not talking about it. You're the first person who really wants to have an honest conversation, not like just try and put me down. And it's really nice to have that. And, you know, we listened to each other. We didn't necessarily agree on everything. But I don't think at any point we attacked each other. And we, we found some areas of common ground. So that just has to happen more, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, this is the way you actually work through issues, right? It's like reasonable discussion. The name calling gets you nowhere.